of being a black woman, so I relate to black issues, and then being a woman, so I relate to women's issues. But the interesting part, I think, most about that is that I never find people relate to mine. Like, I find often, like, I'm like, oh, like, there's, there's a black issue, and, you know, it's everybody on board. And then when it's an issue that affects black women, it's very much like, oh, that's y'all's issue, y'all should handle that. And it's like, when it's a feminist issue, it's like, oh, everybody, all hands on deck, like, everyone, everyone, Hillary, everyone. And, and, then, and then, when it comes to black women's issues, like, okay, like, this is an issue that affects black women, and so, where is everyone? And it's like, oh, y'all got that, that's your issue. So yes, that's my take on that. <laughs> <laughs> I think for me, um, it was already a thought out uh, path my sister and I, by our father. Our father's African American and our mother is Japanese American. And my dad came out of a, a time of civil rights and being free and being in a position of choice was so important, particularly for two girls that he just had. My dad was somewhat of a ladies' man, so he understood all the traps that were out here for beautiful women, women of color, and I think he put very clearly in his mind that he wanted his, his girls to be armed with many things. There's so many different uh, forms of oppression, but I think for our parents and our grandmother, they thought it was really important to be in a position of choice always. So whether you're being, uh, you know, discriminated against, you know, at the workplace, or whether, you know, someone is treating you in a particular way, just always being in a position of choosing will really put you in a, in a better position to always be ahead of the game one. Now. So I think that that um, broad stroke um, really on my sister and I to navigate all of the many different ways and all the different challenges that we were going to face out here as young women of color. So I thought that that was very useful. Uh, <laughs> As women of color, we wear many hats, and so how does this idea of intersectionality, race, and gender apply or impact your daily life? And backstage, we were saying that these questions are hard because it's like it's your life. <laughs> how does race and gender? gender Being in the beer business. <laughs> <laughs> Such a loaded question. Um, one of the challenges we're having right now is that um, recently we got some really great news that um, we we're going to be expanding into Walmart, and that was like, okay, they sell craft beer. <laughs> yeah, the challenge we've had, I think that might touch on the subject uh, question. Uh, race, race and gender, that this is very much a well, uh, male-dominated in industry. So I'm constantly being challenged with the question of, you know, why are you in this industry? This is not for you, what? Wrong gender, wrong race. And it's, it's constantly been, you know, it just comes up all the time. Um, not to mention the question of, uh, when we're out in the marketplace, oftentimes I'm and I'm sorry, I'm going off topic here. I'm, in my interpretation of it, I would just say that um, I'm constantly being faced with the question of one, why is it that I don't have a white woman or a white man walking into these restaurants selling my product because I'm just not going to get anywhere if I don't do that. And I think about our, our society right now, uh, what's happening in the background with all these issues, politics, Black Lives Matter, quality environment, that just seems to be such a contradiction, and it, it frustrates me a lot. Um, on the gender end, because oftentimes the thing with the beer business is that, you know, sex sells, I tend to be identified as the Sugar Hill Girl, or some other yeah. odd title when I go in to, to talk about beer. From a professional standpoint, they just can't get over the fact that I grew. I'm involved with business, so those things are, are constant challenges to me. Just being taken seriously in this business, even talking about hops, or like what you're talking about, just pose with your boobs out and take pictures. This is not what we want to hear. So that that's just my particular experience. 
of those two as it relates to uh, gender and race. Yeah, that's a great point, and maybe we should um, open it up to Brittany and um, Kimberly. What are some of the unique challenges you think you face as women of color in your fields? And if you can just kind of say a little bit more about your field so the audience understands. Sure. Um, well, first of all, hey, everyone. <laughs> Y'all look so dope. Like, <laughs> wonderful brothers and sisters, gender non conformant folks of all colors, <laughs> shapes, and sizes. Welcome. Thank you for being here. Um, and thanks for, for having all of us and hosting this conversation. So, I am um, a part of the common generation, as they like to call us, right? So, when you ask me what my field is, I'm going to say this and this and this and this. <laughs> I'll never forget moving back home to, uh, to St. Louis about three and a half years ago to lead um, a, a, an education nonprofit in St. Louis called Teach for America, which you talked about. And that put me in charge of a central team of about 20 people, um, a, a group of teachers of numbering about 120, over 500 alums, 20,000 students, and about a four and a half million dollar budget, and I was 27. And so the inter it was not just the intersection of gender and race, but also age that accompanied me everywhere I went. And when you have a budget of four and a half million dollars and you are a nonprofit, you gotta go raise it when you're the executive director. And so I was about two months into the job and I went to have um, a, a meeting um, at a, a, a country club where none of the members looked like me and all the servers did. <laughs> and uh, I sit down across the table from a heterosexual, cisgendered white male, like most of the folks I sit across from when I go to raise money. And, um, or at least at that time, that's what it was. And, and I was also accompanied by a colleague of mine who's also male, um, um, gay male. And we're sitting there having this conversation and I, you know, I'm like, just got home and I'm talking about why it's such an incredible privilege for me to be doing this work in the city that raised me for children that I know right next to veteran educators that have influenced me my entire life. And, you know, I use this phrase, you know, well, for people like me, right? Because I was talking about all of the ways in which educational inequity particularly affects black people. I said, you know, for people who look like me, for people who are like me, and the donor, he stops me, and he puts his hand on my hand, and he says, you know, I don't think a lot of people look like you. You're beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> and in my head, I was like, I know. <laughs> <laughs> and being a champion for them. And I leave the meeting with my colleague, thinking I'm gonna have somebody who's gonna co-sign, like, wasn't that wild? And so I, you know, I'm like, that was that was a lot for me. And he goes, Well, you need to use that to raise money. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I didn't know that's why I got hired, right? I didn't know I got hired because I fit some kind of archetypical imagery of what a woman is supposed to be, right? That I wear high heels and skirts, right? That at least today my hair is long, right? That I have features that are Eurocentric enough, but also exotic enough to be considered beautiful by someone who probably ascribes to white dominant standards. So I'm sitting here going, if this is what you had me here for, then you got the wrong one. Okay. <laughs> so those kind of challenges come where you constantly have to defy expectations because the expectations that are before you are so narrow because there's no way that you can both be black and a woman and under 30 and have this big of a job, right, and do it well. And so the, the expectations in the box that I was allowed to be in was so narrow, I constantly found myself having to defy these things every single time. Fast forward to, you want to talk about, about the box being narrow, fast forward to August 10, 2014, when I found myself 15 minutes from my home, standing outside of the Ferguson Police Department protesting. You want to know how to tick wealthy folks off? Is have the nerve to be a black woman with an opinion and to get out on the protest line and tell people about it. Yeah. And now, let's keep in mind, I was with thousands of other people, young people, right, grandmothers, aunties, uncles, um, people who were just like, enough is enough. And as the last year and a half has progressed and making the decision to be truthful to myself and my people, even when it costs me, has, has legitimately cost us, right? There are folks that have stopped cutting checks. There are folks that have stopped calling you and inviting you to the cocktail party. Right? There are people who 
um, want to refuse you all of the trappings of their approval because they want to rescind their approval, right? Uh, because again, you don't fit into the box. Uh, but I just don't believe that, I, that any of us were placed on earth to fit into anybody's boxes. And so, you know, I'm, I'm continuously thankful to the young people and the, the women who I continue to learn from throughout this movement who have helped me stretch outside of my own box, right? And, my, and all of the ways in which I wanted to be intimidated by how hard the work is um, and, and want to default to those things that are just easier and more comfortable for everyone else than myself. Who I had respect for and I knew had a certain degree of respect for me, but not enough to let me make my own decisions. Um, and so that was difficult for me to, I and mean, something that I continue to work through. Uh, I'm lucky because I work in museums, I work in the arts, and so I work in a female-dominated field. Um, but it's not, it, it's, it's, yeah, it's nice, because there's like that we, that capital F feminism does, where it's like, we need to think about diversity. But when you're talking about diversity, you only mean women. And when you're talking about diversity for women, you're only talking about white women. Right. Let's just get real about that. And we're right. not thinking about socioeconomic difference, and we're not thinking about the ways in which gender can be varied. Um, and so for me, I think a lot about intersectionality, and I think a lot about the way that I position myself within my world. Um, and I try to take up as much space as possible, because I have, because I'm black, I'm a woman, and I'm queer. I try to take up as much space as possible, so that I know that I am performing the dynamism that like, is in me, and then also presenting possibilities for others who want to do what I'm doing. So I think of intersectionality as a thing that is very limiting, but also allows you to take up more space in the room and then let people see that there's some room for them too. Great, great, great. Um, thinking about the museum, one of the exhibitions at the inaugural, one of the inaugural exhibitions at the museum is going to be called Making a Way Out of No Way. And it focuses on African Americans' efforts to build schools, churches, and professional organizations <coughs> to support their own community at a time when many such institutions had barred their entry. Can you all tell us what inspired you to make your own way? I want to know. <laughs> I naturally don't like anyone to tell me what to do. <laughs> I work a few jobs, and I just, I don't like bosses. So there's a place for people like me, right? <coughs> so I have to be my own boss. And in being your own boss, it's not just the success that you have to really um, expect. It's also the failures. It's also the hardships. It's everything that comes with, and my dad called it, you have to pay the cost to be the boss. So I think that desire to um, just be able to do things my way was very strong. And I think that that certainly superseded everything. I also chose something that I liked. I chose something that I was good at. And I felt like if I'm going to be my own boss, and I'm going to experience some hardships, at least let me like it. So I tried to set myself up on the front end. So I can work. So, Lessa Demetria, do you want to take that one as well? Uh, absolutely. I would say. Um, I've drawn a lot of inspiration from history. Um, when you're out here, as many of us have been, we constantly have people tell us, no, it's not for you, it's not traditional, why are you in this industry, why do you do this? So I, I love reading about history, and I've drawn so much from history, and from music, but particularly history. And in this particular industry that I'm in, uh, there's so many women that were great brewers, from the Nubians to the Egyptians, all these personalities that we don't know a lot about because a lot of it is in museums, which is why it's exciting to see the opening of the African American Museum of History yes. and Culture. Because when I think about Parliament Funkadelic Parliament <laughs> coming out of this, <laughs> off of that stage as a youngster. And you know, that was the most incredible thing, and I didn't believe in UFOs and all that, but I saw that. And that's inspiring, and to know that you have that here, and, and to learn about all those things that, at least in my opinion, the Smithsonian being an amazing institution and a repository for so much of our history, didn't seem accessible to me. It was like that place that the First Lady said in a video that I saw a couple of days ago that was kind of out of my reach, or for me, 
But I think you know, just being able to get access to just all that information and documentation and social media and access to it online is just you would never sleep with anything that we do with the research, but I draw on so much from that. There's so much information out there. The um, event that we're doing earlier today, we set in on the Randall family talking about early culinary arts, uh, African-American culinarians and the stuff that they did. I just, I just get so inspired by that because so much of it growing up in this country, you're just told over and over and over again that you can't, you couldn't, you never did. And we actually began to think that. So we got access, or we turned it to, we connected to a family member or someone in our neighborhood that was living history, or someone exposing this information to me. So I would just say that for me, in my particular career, and what I want to see happen in the beer industry, a lot of it I've drawn from books and studies from the Urban League on the industry, people that I've met, you know, friends and family that did moonshine or communion wine or you know, all these things that, you know, these little stories that we were kind of told were, you know, embarrassing history. It's actually a lot of good stuff there to talk about. It. So I like, I, I'm just, I just, I look for that and I'm incredibly inspired by it and I want to be able to share that with other people in the community for what I do. I think you're also making a great point about um, family history, community history. Often there's so much in our midst that we sort of take it for granted. And I'm hoping that one of the things the museum will do is people will see the stories there and they'll say, you know, that's my family. That's, you know, where I came from. And they will honor and value and ask the questions of the folks that are still around to answer. Um, I'm actually going to jump forward to another question, which I'd like um, those of you who are very active on social media to think about. Um, Sojourner Truth was well known for selling these small postcard-like photographs of herself to finance her speaking engagements. And... Of course, we know about her activism around um, her speaking. Some of these cards, called Cards de Visites, had a phrase on them, quote, I sell the shadow to support the substance. I wanted to know if that line resonated with all of you, any of you, um, related to your entrepreneurial pursuits, your social media presence, or just generally. Say it again. OK, I sell the shadow to support the substance. Oh, and she won't be beat today. <laughs> Um, okay, all right. Um, two years ago, I, I got this bright idea. I was asked to participate on a reality show. And ten years, for the ten years prior to that, I've been um, I've been a writer. I think that a decently known writer. I, I was an editor at Essence, and I'd written a book, and I had a really popular blog and a social media following. And everyone was when I announced I was doing the show. So it was a reality show um, on Bravo, no less. And people were like, "You've lost your damn mind. Like, like, what, what are you doing? What are you thinking? This is not the place for you." Um, I had a vision of, of what I wanted to do career-wise. I wanted to get to the next level, um, and I was struggling to do so, and it was a great platform, it was a great opportunity, and I thought maybe I could be like the first person in like reality TV history to actually make it work for me. Um, <laughs> some say it did, some say it didn't. I mean, you know, whatever. Um, but it was, it was something that I did, it was it was something I put myself out there because I knew that I had something to say and I knew that maybe people are tuning in for drama and maybe people are tuning in for hair and clothes and makeup and outfits. But when I open my mouth, I have something to say. And so when you follow me on Twitter or Instagram or my blog, you know, if you're expecting to see Caddy back and forth where I'm going back and forth with my castmates, like, no. Like, we're going to talk about Black Lives Matter and we're going to talk about feminism and we're going to talk about race. And we're going to talk about pop culture, and we're going to talk about dating and relationships, and we're going to talk about things that are meaningful and powerful and empowering. Um, Lauren Hill, she's, she's like my, my favorite rapper. I wish she would come back. Um, she had a, a line in Fuji's, and I will not repeat it here because you know there's an F bomb in it. But she was like, even after all my logic and my theory, I had a MF so you agent. So you'll never say that. Um, people, people hear me. So sometimes the shadow that you sell, um, it, it, it's a means to an end. It's, it's the job that you work, the thing that you do um, to support the thing that you want to do. My sister and I had something to say. And we also had something to show. Uh, in the early 2000s, uh, we didn't see Miss Jessie's curly pudding in Target, and there weren't that many uh, hair solutions for women who wanted to rock their hair like you. 
And when I look out in the audience, seeing free form, wash and goes, double strand twist, coil out, I just didn't see that in Brooklyn. Like that. <laughs> We've always had many ways that we express beauty. We've had braids, we've had locks, but uh, my sister and I stumbled upon something. And it was bath time with my son that I realized that I could no longer wear my straight hair straight because naturally my hair is kinky.